The ionosphere makes up less than 1% of the mass of the Earth's atmosphere above 100 kilometers. It's located within the thermosphere, and even though it only contains a small fraction of atmospheric material, it's the part of our atmosphere that affects the passage of radio waves. The chemistry of the ionosphere continuously changes. Victor Kilo 3 Mike Romeo Golf VK3 MRG from ZL1TX. During the day, ionisation in the thermosphere is significantly higher due to increased solar ultraviolet radiation, which decreases at night resulting in lower ionisation levels. Ionisation is the process in which electrically charged and neutral atoms and molecules gain or lose electrons. We breathe O2. This is a molecule consisting of two oxygen atoms that are covalently bonded together. It's essential for life but hundreds of kilometres above us in the ionosphere, you'll find single atoms of oxygen. Oxygen is the third most abundant element in the universe, after hydrogen and helium, and is the second most abundant gas in the atmosphere. Oxygen becomes the dominant atom in the F region of the ionosphere, between 200 and 600 kilometres above the Earth. Most of the ionosphere is electrically neutral, but in the event of a solar storm, solar radiation strikes the chemical ingredients of the atmosphere, dislodging electrons from atoms to produce ionospheric plasma. This process is called ionisation. This only occurs on the sunlit side of the Earth, and only the short wavelengths of solar radiation, known as extreme UV, are energetic enough to produce this ionisation. The presence of these charged particles turns the upper atmosphere into an electrical conductor, which supports electrical currents and affects radio waves. These free electrons are lost from the ionosphere when they recombine with charged or ionised oxygen atoms. This process occurs constantly. Here's the takeaway for amateur radio operators. The lifetime of free electrons increases with altitude, so it's greatest in the oxygen-rich F2 layer. It's just one reason why the F region persists through the night. The typical lifetime of free electrons in the E, F1 and F2 layers are 20 seconds, 1 minute and 20 minutes respectively. VK3YE portable, G4AKC uh, bicycle mobile. You come up to a six and then you'll uh, QSB down um, quite a lot. I'll pass the microphone over to Steve and he can give you a report as well. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And uh, good day, Peter. Yeah, great day today, Peter. Portable. Victor Kilo 3, Yankee Echo Portable. Go for it, November. Victor Fox, that's Bicycle Mobile. Back here, Peter. Yeah, Roger. G4 NVF VK3 Yankee Echo, both portable. The radio spectrum affected to some extent by the ionosphere ranges from extremely low frequencies up to super high frequencies. In general, on frequencies below 30 MHz, the ionosphere is essential to users. Whereas on frequencies much above 50 MHz, the ionosphere is a source of annoyance. For example, in Earth space communications. Ionospheric radio propagation is characterised by amplitude fading and absorption, making it unreliable for certain users. But yes, the band is uh, unstable, up and down, uh, very, very deep QSB here. But Hence, in recent years, there has been a shift to higher frequency bands, 
where undesirable ionospheric effects are less pronounced. Today, uh, Mark's running the three gig stuff here, and he's uh, using a panel. So um, he's uh, there and waiting, waiting, camping at the bit for someone to contact him on three gig. (laughs) Nevertheless, high frequencies are still used extensively for long distance broadcasting and point to point communications. Here's the structure of the ionosphere in the mid-latitudes on a summer's day and the main bands of solar and cosmic ionising radiations. The mathematical theory of radio propagation in the ionosphere in the presence of the Earth's magnetic field was developed in the 1920s by British physicist Sir Edward Appleton. The formula for the refractive index is usually associated with his name. What we know as the F layer today is also known as the Appleton layer. The F2 layer is the most important region for HF skywave propagation because it's present 24 hours of the day. For long communication paths, its high altitude reduces the required number of hops and it usually refracts the highest frequencies in the HF range. Radio frequencies are affected differently by the ionosphere. The spectrum is divided predominantly into eight ranges from ELF or extremely low frequency to SHF or super high frequency. Extremely low frequency is less than three kilohertz. Its earth ionosphere waveguide penetrates seawater. So its primary use is land to submarine communications. Very low frequency, or VLF, is between 3 and 30 kHz. Its waveguide between the ground and lower ionosphere, as well as the ground wave, make it ideal for navigation and communication. Medium frequency, or MF, is between 300 and 3000 kHz and is characterised by E-region reflection at night and ground wave by day. High frequency, or HF, is between 3 and 30 MHz. These frequencies propagate by reflection from D, E and F regions, making it very popular for amateur radio use. Good afternoon, Victor Kilo 3 Sierra Alpha Yankee. As the variation in propagation characteristics over the 80 to 10 meter band is considerably different according to the time of day and the levels of ionization. VHF, or very high frequency, lies between 30 and 300 megahertz. It propagates predominantly by line of sight, or scatter from the ionosphere. Ultra high frequency, or UHF, is between 300 and 3000 megahertz. Propagation here is almost always line of sight, which is rarely affected by ionospheric irregularities. Finally, SHF, or super high frequency, 3 to 30 gigahertz, again is line of sight, affected by the troposphere and by ionospheric irregularities. Very good afternoon, uh, Peter. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, David. G4AKC, uh, portable, VK3 uh, Yankee Echo portable. Uh, good signals, uh, Dave, five by eight. Operating from a very different location, I haven't worked you from here before. I'm on Mount Martha, about maybe 70 or so kilometres south of Melbourne, um, maybe a bit less. Um, but very quiet receiving location, excellent signal. I know I'd be able to hear you even if you're down at one watt. The ionosphere varies greatly because of the changes in two sources of ionisation. It responds to UV radiation as it varies over the daytime and nighttime, as well as the 11 year sunspot cycle. On a shorter time scale, solar X ray radiation increases D and E region ionisation dramatically when a solar flare occurs. For HF communications, Radio waves propagate from one location to another by bouncing off the ionosphere. 
there are three important atmospheric parameters with the daily and solar cycle variability. Nmax, a measure of electron density, MUF or the maximum usable frequency, and TEC, which is the total electron count. The critical parameters are the maximum and lowest usable frequencies, MUF and LUF, that the ionosphere can support. This changes through the day, over the solar cycle, and during geomagnetic disturbances. The LUF is controlled by the amount of absorption of radio waves in the D and E region and is severely affected by solar flares. The usage frequency window for radio propagation lies between the lowest and maximum usable frequencies. When the window closes, as shown here, a shortwave fade occurs. There are certain regions of the ionosphere, mainly the high latitude and low latitude F region, and certain local times, principally after sunset, when the ionosphere may become highly turbulent. For both low and high latitude regions, these irregularities occur most frequently during the solar cycle maximum period. Roger, roger, VK3R portable, VK3KQ portable. 10 over 9, Pete, 10 over 9, how copy, over, over. This video touches on just a few of the many variables that affect the ionosphere. It really is a place where chemistry and physics collide. Everything interacts, and we're lucky to have so many real-time online tools to help us understand our environment. It's what makes amateur radio what it is today.